Hello, hello. Welcome to our 11 a.m. press conference, which we're calling the Paleo Climate Record Points to Potential Rapid Climate Changes. We have three speakers. James Hansen, director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. Elko Rowling, professor of ocean and climate change at Southampton University in Southampton in the United Kingdom. And our third speaker is Ken Caldera, senior scientist, Department of Global Ecology at the Carnegie Institution of Washington at Stanford University in Stanford, California. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Since uh, these charts have been set up on this computer here, I'm going to sit here. But I can see you, and you can see me, I think. Um, you know, humans have become a major factor in driving climate change. We can, the, the observed increases in well-mixed greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide, have uh, an impact on the planet's energy budget. We can calculate that very precisely. It amounts to a climate forcing now of about three watts per meter squared compared to the pre-industrial atmosphere. And a climate forcing is an imposed perturbation of the planet's energy balance, um, which would tend to drive uh, global temperature change. Uh, now, we can try to understand there are other things that are happening also, both natural and human-made. There are human-made aerosols, which on average have a cooling effect and are not as well measured, a forcing of something between minus one and minus two watts. But we can try to understand this in a number of different ways, what we should expect. Uh, starting at the bottom of this list, climate models are helpful uh, in theory, uh, but of course, we never know whether we have all the physics in the climate models and how accurate that is. Observations of what's happening today are in response to this rapid increase in CO2 is also useful, but there are other factors going on. Um, and uh, the third thing is looking at the Earth's climate history. We can learn a lot uh, from that. Um, and we need to do all of these things. But in particular, let me show you this graph. This is an estimate of the global deep ocean temperature over the last 65 million years. And it's often said that, well, there are huge natural climate changes, so why should we worry about the human-made one? And in fact, this graph shows just how large they are. Uh, in the first period from 65 to 34 million years ago, the planet was so warm that there were no large ice sheets on the planet, and sea level was about 70 meters higher. Uh, we know that in the early part of this period, CO2 was of the order of 1,000 parts per million, and um, it has been as low as 170 parts per million during the coldest periods. We know why this la large, long-term first warming up until 50 million years ago, and then cooling over the last 50 million years. The principal reason for that was changes in atmospheric carbon dioxide, because the forcings that would change the climate have to be due to either the energy coming into the planet or changes within the atmosphere or changes on the surface. But the sun is a well-behaved main sequence star. It's been slowly getting brighter over that period, a forcing of about one watt. The changes on the surface are relatively small because the, the continents were already close to their pl present uh, location, so the effect of that on the albedo is less than one watt per meter squared. But the change of CO2 from 1,000 ppm to 170 is a forcing of 10 watts. So that's the dominant uh, forcing. And what this tells us is that the the rate of that natural change, long-term change, due to the change in the source of CO2. The natural source is volcanoes. The natural sink is primarily the weathering process, which takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, but the rate of change of CO2 in the atmosphere on those long timescales at the fastest uh, 
on the million year time scale is about one ten thousandth of a ppm per year. And that's a large change. In a million years, it's 100 ppm. But humans are changing CO2 by 2 ppm per year. So now humans overwhelm the natural changes and will determine the future atmospheric composition and the climate. Now, we like to talk about the climate sensitivity uh, to a forcing. That uh, depends upon the climate forcing. Usually we talk about a double CO2. That's a four watt forcing. Um, the sensitivity depends upon the climate state. And usually we start with today's climate state. But when you look at the paleoclimate record, you have to bear that in mind, that it, it can change with the climate state. It depends upon the time scale. And most commonly, we look at the talk about the equilibrium response. We mean give the ocean long enough to warm up in response to that forcing. But we're not waiting long enough for the ice sheets to change their size or say the methane hydrates to be sta destabilized. Uh, then we can use, you see these long period changes in the Earth's temperature that were due to the CO2 changes. Uh, th the reason those occurred, by the way, was because in the first 10 million years, India was moving through the Indian Ocean and, and through this carbonate-rich ocean floor, releasing CO2 to the atmosphere. It got up to over 1,000 ppm. But since India collided with Asia and reduced that source, CO2 has been declining. But in the recent time, you can see these oscillations of uh, climate from glacial to interglacial. Those are associated with the perturbations in the Earth's orbit, the so-called Milankovitch uh, orbital perturbations, which uh, represent a forcing of only a fraction of a watt per meter squared averaged over the planet. But in some parts of the planet, it's a positive forcing, and some parts a negative. That can cause an ice sheet to melt, for example. And as the ice sheet gets smaller, that changes the surface albedo. As the ocean gets warmer, it releases CO2. So the two principal mechanisms that are involved in these glacial to interglacial oscillations are changes in the surface albedo of the planet and changes in the atmospheric CO2 and some other trace gases. But we can compare the current interglacial period with the last ice age and get a measure of the uh, climate sensitivity in the way that I defined it. Because we know the change in the area of the ice sheets represents a forcing of about three and a half watts, while the change in greenhouse gases is a forcing of about three watts. That implies a sensitivity because the global temperature change was approximately five degrees Celsius. It implies a sensitivity of about three quarters of a degree for each uh, watt of forcing, which is three degrees for doubled CO2. And we can actually check that uh, sensitivity over the 800,000 year period of the ice core records because we have accurate knowledge of atmospheric composition over that period and we have um, accurate data on sea level changes and it's the sea level changes that tell us how big the ice sheets were. So we can calculate with a simple radiation uh, calculation how large the forcings were as a function of time over that 800,000 year period. And we can compare that with both the deep ocean temperature record, where the deep ocean temperature changes are about two-thirds as large as the global surface air temperatures. And we can compare with the temperatures on the tops of the ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica, where the temperature changes are about twice as large as the global mean temperature because of the amplification that you get at high latitudes. And what we find is that that sort of sensitivity um, agree is, uh, is fits the entire record. So we can, there, there are different choices you can make in uh, de defining the climate sensitivity. So there's some uh, variation depending upon the choices that different uh, researchers make. But 
we can say that the equilibrium sensitivity to doubled CO2 is of the order of a few degrees. And now we can compare that with the temperature changes that have occurred on the Earth over the last thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, the bottom part uh, shows these last uh, glacial to interglacial oscillations, and the top graph shows the last five million years. So if you go back to the early Pliocene, the temperature was uh, only one to two degrees warmer than the peak Holocene temperature. Uh, less than two degrees uh, warmer than the peak Holocene temperature. That, uh, <laughs> that tells us that we, we can't double CO2 because the equilibrium response to that would be three of the order of three degrees Celsius, which means we would be um, sending the climate eventually back to a state which um, is extremely different than what uh, humanity is accustomed to. Civilization developed entirely during the Holocene, which um, had a very relatively stable climate and stable sea level. Well, what paleoclimate can't do very well is tell us how fast uh, the slow feedbacks will come into play, like the ice sheet size. Uh, we can look at some present observations. We began to make accurate measurements of the mass of the ice sheets earlier this, uh, in about less than a decade ago with the gravity satellite. And what we can see is that the ice sheets are beginning to lose mass. And although the record is short, it looks like the rate at which they're losing mass is accelerating. Um, and the other thing that we can say both from the paleoclimate record and our understanding of the carbon cycle is that the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, a large fraction of that is going to stay in the atmosphere for a very long time. It takes millennia for the uh, climate system to put the CO2 back into the solid earth as carbonate deposits on the ocean floor. So if the, the graph on the right shows how rapidly CO2 would decline if we totally stopped fossil fuel burning at 2010 or 2030 or 2050. And you can see if we wait a couple of decades uh, that CO2 will, would remain, even in that idealized case of total uh, stopping of fossil fuel emissions, it would remain far above uh, the levels that have existed in, in the last uh, millennia. And uh, what that tells us is that we cannot burn all of the fossil fuels. So far, all we have burned is the purple parts of the oil, gas, and coal conventional fossil fuels. Um, if we burned all of the fossil fuels, we would send the planet back to the ice-free state. We can't say how long it would take to get there, but we know that uh, the, this rate of change would be accelerating rapidly. And yet the governments and, and fossil fuel industry assume that we can just continue to go right ahead and go after all of the coal and even begin to develop these unconventional fossil fuels like tar sands and tar shale uh, and hydrofracking. Uh, so that is a message which somehow we have not, um, do not seem to have communicated um, uh, as well as we need to. But now I'm going to turn this over to Elko Rowling. Yeah. Can I borrow the point of Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'm going to uh, provide a little bit more uh, depth on what Jim was just saying. Um, I'm first going to be looking at sort of what sort of disequilibrium are we on at the moment for in terms of, of uh, sea level change, ice, ice volume adjustment, uh, and then uh, how fast can we expect some of these adjustments to take place. And then there's a, a short one on uh, climate sensitivity estimates. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a very complicated diagram, and I'm just going to uh, very quickly talk you through it over the main points. 
Um, what I'm trying to establish here is, is in a natural state, what would our current climate forcing mean for where sea level wants to be? Um, so I'm not saying anything yet about the time scales. That will come in a minute. This is climate forcing. This is the scale of, of, of watts per square meter that, that Jim was just talking about. Zero is where we started off pre-industrial, and 1.6 is the net climate forcing that we have already affected as a, by the emissions, and some of that has been offset by what you have undoubtedly heard about the global dimming. So we're on about 1.6 watts per square meter forcing, and this is a scale that is a oxygen isotopes in the deep sea, but it is basically a measure of sea level change. And what you see here in purple is a cloud of data for the last 500,000 years that comes from ice cores and, and very well constrained sea level records. Then in red you can see points that are being developed at the moment for the last 10 million years. The density of that cloud is increasing uh, as we speak. People are continuously measuring now. And in blue is a cloud of data that is gradually being increased that actually takes this uh, back to down to 40 million years ago. And what we can see here is that this sea level relationship is, is, is very consistent. It doesn't really matter whether you project out from only part of the cloud or the entire cloud. We have this relationship, what is the sort of the basic underlying natural relationship between sea level and climate forcing. And if we use that, then at 1.6 watts per square meter forcing, where we are at the moment, then we would expect the equilibrium sea level in the natural state to be 25 plus or minus 3 or 5 meters above the present. So this is essentially the elastic band of climate that we are stretching. We are creating a disequilibrium. Now the problem is we are not only stretching that, we're stretching it really quickly. So the system cannot keep up at all. And this is these, these numbers, that's millennia in the future. But the adjustment similar to yanking an, elect, an elastic band really quickly, there could be snaps in there, and we could have very abrupt adjustments happening. And these abrupt adjustments, we can say something about if we go to the last interglacial. So if you can go to the next slide, please. In the last interglacial, sea level went to a mean position between four and six meters above the present, so it's higher than today. Part of that is because of a reduction of the Greenland ice sheet. Here is a model simulation of the Greenland ice sheet. There are more. They're not all the same, but effectively all of them suggest that about half the ice sheet disappears. That gives you about three meters of, of sea level rise. So these numbers suggest that Antarctica was in fault. So we don't have to guess. We know Antarctica was involved. Now what we have done is we have developed a sea level re record through the last interglacial. And what we found is that there are a couple of fast adjustments in there. And these are all natural adjustments, so not anything to do with anthropogenic change. But nature shows us that the adjustment rates that you can get of sea level above the present, so ice sheet reducing further than today at one to two and a half meters per century. So nature knows how to do this, even with the ice sheets that are as small as they are now. So we're not talking about a glacial ice sheet, we're talking about the interglacial ice sheet. We start off here more or less at zero meters, where we start off also today, and these rates of rise can become of the order of meters per century. So that's what nature is telling us here. It, it knows how to do this, and, and that's the sort of rapid adjustment rates that we are potentially toying with. If we can go to the next slide, please, Jim. This is uh, just, you know, this is a, a record that was made, a continuous record that was made using a specific technique, the Red Sea technique. I can go into that later if, if you're interested. But it's also seen in uh, corals and for the last interglacial, corals can be really well dated with uranium series, and they are quite well known to have at least two, maybe three, uh, specific high stands uh, visible in the corals of the last interglacial, so com communicating to at least these big two, and maybe also the third uh, high stand. So the next slide, please, Jim, and then I'll wrap this up. 
This is just, um, we're, we're currently in a, uh, the, called the PaleoSense working group. Um, we started to look at climate sensitivity from paleo records exactly for this problem that Jim was alluding to before. It really depends how you report it. What is your reference system? What are your definitions? And, and which periods are we considering? There is no agreement yet in the community how to do this, so that's what we're trying to establish with this working group. And here we put 18 individual studies and compilations together, and what you can see in terms of the climate sensitivity, this is in, watts, in degrees per watt per meter square. This is uh, the equivalent numbers in Celsius for doubling of CO2, and the equivalent numbers in Fahrenheit for doubling of CO2. And what we can see is that there is an agreed range, more or less, all these studies are within that sort of common range of, of uh, 2.6 to 4.8 degrees for a doubling of CO2, but there is a lot of variability. This variability is not because we don't understand what we're doing, this variability is because everybody includes different things in their studies. So what we need is a common denominator that we need to agree how are we going to report this and that common denominator needs to tie in with, with, with what the modelers need. And so that's what this group is trying to establish. Here, 18, is the, uh, the, the, the Schmidtner study that came out recently in science. And as you can see, it falls within the distribution. It is not lower than any previously reported values. It's not getting as high as previously reported values. And that, again, is due to the, the decisions they make, how they report it. What do they include? What do they exclude? So it's the choices and the definitions they use. So, but they are also within that same distribution of, uh, of values. So I would hand over to uh, Ken. Okay, so on this um, session here, we're focusing on ice sheets and rapid sea level rise and so on, but we could have done a different session where we focused on ocean acidification or the threat of heat stress on tropical ecosystems or heat on Arctic ecosystems. And so just because we're focusing on ice sheets and sea level rise, that doesn't mean that's the only thing we're concerned about. So one of the uh, confusions that comes up is people talk about what is climate sensitivity. And really there are many different things that are referred to using the same term. And different studies make different assumptions about what you're considering being held constant and what's allowed to operate as a feedback. So for example, some studies will allow the size of the ice sheets to change. Some studies will allow the aerosol concentrations to change as a feedback. Some studies will allow the vegetation to change. And so depending on which things you're allowed, allowed to change in, in your framework, you'll come up with different numbers. And it's not a scientific difference, but it's merely a difference in nomenclature. And just as an analogy, we can think of the question of if I add a given uh, mass of air to a balloon, how much will that balloon expand? Well, if I tell you that balloon is inside of a box and that additional air is just going to increase pressure, the balloon won't expand at all. If it's here at Earth's surface, you know, it'll expand a lot. If it's in the bottom of the ocean, it'll expand a little bit. And so the answer to the question, how much will the balloon expand when you add additional air, depends uh, on what you're assuming about the external conditions, what, what you're uh, uh, assuming are feedbacks uh, that will operate. And in the same way, how much will the Earth increase in temperature due to an addition of CO2 depends uh, on what you're assuming in terms of feedbacks and time scales. And some feedbacks occur right away within weeks after an addition of carbon dioxide. Uh, other feedbacks, such as changes in glacial ice mass, might take considerably longer. Um, I don't have time to explain this complicated diagram, but th this appeared, uh, uh, this work we did, I think, appeared in Science a couple years ago. A and the upshot of this study was looking at an event from 50 million years ago it suggested that um, uh, 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 a lot of methane was released into the environment and that the Earth heated up something like five and a half to eight degrees C for each CO2 doubling, which is 10 to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And it's still not understood why the Earth heated so much. It might be that wetlands formed at high latitudes, and this allowed, uh, there was a methane feedback. And this was a time without ice sheets, so it can't be the ice sheet feedback. But just to say that there is paleo evidence that climate sensitivity might be dramatically higher than, than what a lot of the current climate models are suggesting. Rushing along now, um, you know, this is a simplified version of, of what Elko showed you that, uh, you know, that if you look at what the, uh, you can move those temperatures around a little bit, you can't move the sea level very much, but if you look at, uh, you know, how temperature and sea level has varied in the past, we see, uh, you know, huge uh, sensitivity, many, ten, many tens of meters for the amount of warming to be expected from a CO2 doubling. Uh, if we, then the question is, well, how fast will this happen? Uh, if we look at the broad uh, deglaciation, we can see that sea level rose something like, uh, uh, you know, 100 meters in, what, 7,000 years, so, you know, well over a meter year average. There were short pulse events, or, and this is in response to slow changes in orbital parameters, and so when we hit the system with a hammer, like a huge uh, pulse of CO2, you know, will, will we get this slow kind of response, or will we see a faster response? We don't really know. The, uh, the other point here is about how long carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere. This is from a paper we did with Dave Archer a couple of years ago. This is the time scales here. It's 1,000 years, 10,000 years. This is a putting, a, sort of putting all of the, re <coughs> the conventional uh, recoverable fossil fuels in the atmosphere. And this is the number of CO2 doublings. So this would be maybe like a 3-degree warming, 6-degree, 9-degree, something like that. And we see that even 10,000 years out, if we burn the fossil fuel reserves, uh, uh, resources, we're still sort of even in the most optimistic uh, scenario, uh, CO2 doubling 10,000 years from now and maybe up to four times the CO2, uh, 10 times CO2, uh, 10,000 10, years from now, which could be enough to, you know, threaten the big uh, ice sheets. And so the last thing I want to end on is just a little uh, motherhood and apple pie that, you know, to say that the science uh, helps us understand what the facts are, but, uh, you know, that our values come from morality and we can derive our morality from different sources, but that uh, really you need the two of these things together uh, to, to drive good policy and that science in itself doesn't tell us what to do. And I think I'll just stop there. Okay, do we have questions? Uh, Steve Connor from The Independent. It's a question for Jim Hansen. Um, the Global Climate Project, I think, recently published some results in Nature saying that we're now back on course for increasing uh, CO2 emissions not just increasing CO2 emissions, but accelerating increasing CO2 emissions. I think something like 10 billion tons released in 2010 after the dip in 29. Given the fact that Durban is now taking place, um, how long can we go on like this, do you, do you think, before it really becomes too late to do anything? Well, you said and how long can these emissions continue to increase rapidly until it would become too late to do anything. Well, to do anything, of course, at, at any time when you begin to decrease the emissions, that will have some effect. However, what the paleoclimate record tells us is that the dangerous level of global warming is less than what we thought a few years ago. It, it was natural to think that warming of a in a few degrees didn't sound so bad. <laughs> but when we look at the paleoclimate record, we see that just going back to the Pliocene, although the poles were a lot warmer then, the global mean temperature wasn't that much warmer. So we can't, the, the target that has been talked about in international negotiations of two degrees Celsius for uh, global warming is actually a prescription for long-term disaster. We can't say exactly what long-term is, but we're beginning to see signs of slow feedbacks beginning to come into play already. Uh, the ice sheets are beginning to lose mass at a significant rate. 
even methane hydrates are to some degree beginning to bubble out of uh, melting permafrost. So if we, what I will show in a paper that I'm not presenting at this conference, but will uh, with a number of co-authors, including Elko, uh, be trying to finish up in the next month or so, is a, a reaffirmation of a uh, conclusion that we made a couple of years ago that we really should be aiming to keep CO2 no higher than about 350 parts per million and possibly somewhat less than that if we want to keep the climate similar, not too different than the Holocene. And that is probably necessary if we want to uh, maintain stable ice sheets and stable shorelines and, and avoid many other uh, issues that we did not try to go into today. Uh, so with, if that's the goal, to stay at, to, to get the CO2 down to 350 ppm within a century or so, that would require, we started today, and if we assume that reforestation could take up uh, 100 gigatons of CO2. That would be essentially going back to the pre-deforestation uh, levels. Then we would have to reduce CO2 emissions at 6% per year beginning, if we began next year. If we began in, in uh, five years ago, then it would have been 3% per year. And if we wait till 2020, it becomes 15% per year. So if, we, if we're hoping to maintain a climate, a planet that looks like the one that, that humanity has known, then we're basically out of time right now. We've, we've got to start to reduce emissions. And so this continued rapid growth uh, makes it uh, exceedingly difficult. Um, we've, got, we've got to turn that around. It's scientifically clear. Other questions? Hi, Mason Inman with National Geographic News. This is for Ken. Um, when you said the climate sensitivity could be a lot higher than, um, than what we had thought from looking at the past, can you say a little bit more about that? So there's not a single number, but the sensitivity could increase as the planet gets warmer, or? Well, again, it's this issue of what feedbacks you're going to consider if, uh, I mean, one feedback that was just alluded to is the loss of methane from the permafrost in Siberia. And so if, for example, additional CO2 causes a lot of that methane to be introduced to the atmosphere as methane, there could be considerably more warming. And so if you're asking what is the sensitivity to CO2 alone, you might get, uh, you know, without considering the feedbacks on the methane, you might get a number like three degrees per CO2 doubling, but if you're considering these methane feedbacks, the number could be considerably higher. And so that's the sort of thing I was alluding to. If I could just add to that. So in a paper that Makiko Sato and I wrote, which is in press at this time, we argue that the glacial to interglacial changes show you that the climate sensitivity excluding the ice sheet feedback and excluding methane hydrates is about approximately three degrees for double CO2. But if you include the change due to the surface albedo change as ice sheets come to a new equilibrium, then the sensitivity is approximately double that. Um, there are also negative feedbacks that may come into play. Uh, the carbon cycle, the, the system may begin to take up CO2 more rapidly as the climate gets warmer, for example. But that feedback is, is, um, is pretty slow. So what's unique about the human forcing, it's so rapid. We don't have any example in the paleoclimate record of a positive forcing that is so incredibly rapid. The closest example is probably the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. But then you're talking about 
an increase in methane and CO2 that occurred over the time scale of millennia, while we're doing it at least an order of magnitude faster on the order of a century. Mark Hertzgard from The Nation magazine. Um, I'm sure you all saw that the, that recent study that came out of Oregon State got a lot of attention in the world media. And a lot of uh, uh, people said, geez, finally some good news on this. Maybe we have a little more wiggle room here than thought. Um, it sounds like all of you today are rejecting that view on the understandable grounds that it depends on the definitions that you apply. I talked to Jim a little bit about this before the session begins. But could I push each of you on that a little bit further? Could you tell us, I uh, understand it's a problem you're all working on, but is there some way to give the layperson a little bit better sense of where we are on this, A, and B, how long before you expect to have uh, greater agreement within the scientific community about this? Yeah, so I've, um, I'll, I'll kick this one off. The, um, th that study, as I said, it is the first thing to, to see in that it, that is within the envelope of the sort of values that are around. So in that sense, there's nothing new. It's just, you know, the, the probability they give to the very low end is probably not so realistic. The values certainly are in the same distribution. The, uh, well, you know, I've, I've, for example, I've got a paper coming out in, in Journal of Climate uh, where, where the press release is tomorrow, uh, which, which basically looks at long records. Um, and, and what we find out is that you, you, you get much higher values. So, and that's just, again, the sort of choices that you make which, which matter. So that's what the, the working group that I just alluded to is exactly trying to address because there is this enormous confusion even amongst the scientists on how to report things and what we need is a common reporting. So when can we expect to make an improvement is, is if and when we get this accepted within the community. This is why we are trying to do this as a community statement to decide, okay, like whatever you do in your study, also report it this way. And if you do report it that way, then at least we can compare one study with another one rather than comparing apples and oranges. So to remove that confusion should be fairly straightforward if we can get this paper, of course, uh, that we're working on, this statement uh, published. And then hopefully the community will start to accept it as a common way of reporting, even though the rest of the study could be looking into specific little issues. They report the number at least for climate sensitivity in that common context. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that progress will be made with that very quickly and that we will adopt a certain, certain value how to do this. Um, I think that will be very difficult because the, uh, you know, the, basically the papers that will be taken into there are, that's almost closed. But the people that are working on AR5 are actually part of this. So, so there, is, there is knowledge that this is developing and there is also knowledge of this study in Journal of Climate that I alluded to that this is on the, uh, you know, it's, it's our, is our study. That, and, and that's also already uh, being taken into account by the AR5. But as I said, you know, none of these studies is wrong. They are just part of the distribution, and it's the reporting, it's the nomenclature where things go wrong. It's like taxonomy. We need a common framework to report this. If I could add just one point to that. It, there is one uh, way to understand uh, simply why the Schmittner et al. number was somewhat smaller than what um, I think is the main conventional estimate. And that is they were using this glacial to interglacial comparison to get an empirical climate sensitivity. When you do that, you, those, those climate states, the current interglacial and the last ice age, are what we call quasi-equilibrium states. The, the climate would continue to change on long time scales as forcings such as the Earth orbital parameters change. But the planet is 
in energy balance in both of those states, in the ice age and in the interglacial, within a very small fraction of one watt per meter squared. So we can use the boundary conditions in those two different states and compare what are, are the forcings associated with the boundary conditions. And, and as I showed, the CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide greenhouse gas change is about three watts difference between the ice age and interglacial. The change in the surface reflectivity is about three and a half watts. Now the reason they got a smaller sensitivity was they included another forcing. They said there's more aerosols during the ice age and that has a certain radiative flux associated with it. Well, I think in the standard case, you would rather say the aerosols changed between the ice age and the interglacial because the climate changed. And they adjust quite rapidly to the climate change. So normally, I would say you, you would put the aerosol change in the fast feedback category, which is being assessed as part of the sensitivity rather than as a boundary forcing. If you, do, if you look in their supplementary material, you will see that they did that case also. When they counted the aeros they excluded the aerosol forcing, the climate sensitivity that they got was three degrees Celsius for doubled CO2. <laughs> so that was kind of an accident that they got exactly a value in the middle of the range because there are a number of things different about their study. They used a model which is, uh, intermediate complexity model which has merits and demerits and they also uh, they used a estimate for ice age ocean temperatures which is at the extreme end of the range of what people have estimated so there it's kind of accidental that it came out three degrees when you exclude the aerosols but the truth is it didn't really change anything in our perception of the sensitivity of the system. Just to expand just a little bit on that, um, I would say, you know, if you look at IPCC or other uh, estimates of the uncertainty in climate sensitivity, that's a pretty wide envelope. And so I would say most, uh, most people's envelope sort of centers around three degrees. I think theirs was closer to two degrees, but it's certainly within the range, and so my, my sense of their study is two different things. One is that there, there's this definitional question of what do you consider feedbacks and what feedbacks were they considering, but my basic perception is just when scientists estimate their uncertainties, you list the uncertainties you can think about and you don't quantify the other ones, and I think just they sort of maybe were a little overconfident in, in their, in, and presented too narrow an uncertainty range, but their range certainly overlaps the accepted range. I mean, I presented some published stuff saying that for the Eocene it was between, uh, what, what 5.5 to 8 degrees C per CO2 doubling, and you know, you could, I, I would be open to arguments that we presented too narrow a range and really you should have said four to nine or something like that. And so I think it's the same thing that we're, it's probably just a little overconfident but, but th I think they're within the range of what most of the community thinks. Let's go ahead with a question uh, from can, the, can I, can from I the just, chat. Sorry, can I just quickly add something? That it, it's very important also that you know, even at those slightly lower values in the lower end of the sort of common rep reported band that they come up with, the problems that Jim has just portrayed would just be postponed by another 20 or 30 years. Right. right. It, so these values are not far away from what we are talking about. They are very close. Right. right. If, if climate sensitivity is two-thirds of what most people think, that means it'll take another 50 percent before the, the amount of, you know, it'll take 1.5 times as long for those bad things to happen. Okay. Let's go on with a question from the chat, please. Uh, I think if that question was similar to an earlier one, 
Could, could you repeat that again and see if there's a different nuance to it? Oh, t at what point are we committed to an ice-free world? Um, the study that we did in 2008 estimated that in coming down from the ice-free world to an ice sheet on Antarctica, which occurred 34 million years ago, we estimated that that transition occurred at a CO2 level of, of about 500 ppm. Now, some other studies, in fact, I think actually the best fit was 450 ppm. Uh, but some other studies have estimated larger numbers. And, but usually those involve a model and, you know, ice sheet models, unfortunately, as yet, we don't have uh, good ice sheet models that will put in all the, uh, the physics that's needed. It's a very hard problem because it depends upon ice shelves around the ice sheets. When those melt, then the ice sheets become more active and their ice streams discharge ice more rapidly. Um, and there's also the issue about hysteresis. Do you go, if you're going backward, do you need to have a higher level of CO2 to, to reach the point where uh, you lose the ice sheet? So it's a very hard question to answer, but it, it, the equilibrium response, as Elko showed, if you uh, doubled CO2, which Practically all governments and seem to be assuming that, that we're going to do that and they act as if it's okay. <laughs> that would eventually get us to the ice-free state. Uh, probably, a close, it's approximately that. Uh, so we really can't do that. Uh, but that has not yet sunk in to policymakers had. Uh, I, I think Elko should try to clarify what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when that happens. Um, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the biggest problem is to project from what we are looking at is a cooling climate over time and to project that forward into a warming climate because the presence of a large ice sheet keeps the planet there locally quite cold. So they, they tend to preserve themselves to some extent. This is similar to when you switch off your freezer and then you can just wait a couple of hours and nothing happens and then as it starts to melt suddenly it will go very quickly. Um, now, th so that's what Jim means with the hysteresis. You have to give the system a bigger kick to melt that ice than that you have to uh, push it to actually start to form that ice. How se severe that, that hysteresis is, is completely open to question. What I showed, uh, where we're going to 25 meters above the present, we are looking at the fast ice there. That is not the East Antarctic, the main body of the East Antarctic ice sheet, if that goes as well, then sea level will go up to 60, 70 meters above the present. So what, what I was looking at is the ice that probably doesn't need so much kicking, and that's where, uh, you know, the sort of numbers that Jim was saying do apply. You know, a doubling of CO2 would be really bad news if you sustain that for a good couple of centuries. Um, to really remove also East Antarctica to pump sea level up to about 60 or 70 meters above the present, we probably have to do something much closer to, you know, another doubling, I would have guessed, because that ice sheet tends to preserve itself quite efficiently. And maybe 25 meters is enough that it really doesn't matter, <laughs> <laughs> whether it's 25 or 65. Yeah, it doesn't just, really matter. <laughs> just to expand on the answer to Seth, so there have been a number of modeling and observational studies that have suggested numbers that are a little higher. 
say, 750 ppm. So this is an area of current research, and there's not a complete consensus. Do we have any other questions? Even that 750 ppm is a value that we would reach by the end of this century with a continuation of current emission trends. Uh, Kit Stoltz, Ventura County Star. A lot of scientists at this uh, conference are looking at extremes. Are you looking at um, modeling or estimating extreme behavior at the climate? Did, did you hear the question? Yeah, it was about modeling. The, the question is extreme events. Um, well, I, I I could say one thing based on uh, some graphs, uh, some calculations that we did uh, several weeks ago and sent, I sent out on my, to my email distribution, and that's with regard to extreme temperatures, where um, what we find is that if we define climatology from the period just before the rapid warming that's occurred over the last 30 years, if we use the period 1950 to 1980 to define a climatology, then the events, the seasonal mean ex extreme events that were um, a three sigma event at that time would typically cover a few tenths of 1% of the planet or alternatively would occur a few tenths of 1% of the time at a given location. Well, with the, we've looked at how frequently those extremes occurred in the last five years, and it was more like 10% of the land area was, uh, had what were three sigma events um, several decades ago. So that means the events like in Texas and Oklahoma this last summer and in Moscow the summer before, those kind of events, those are exceeding the three sigma level. And that, what I'm saying is that that now, instead of occurring a few tenths of a percent of the time, has, recurred more than order, has increased more than order of magnitude. Um, so I think that the perceptive person should be beginning to notice that things are changing. Um, the, what may be equally or more important is the changes in the frequency of extreme precipitation events and therefore floods and the other side of the hydrologic cycle, the frequency of extreme droughts. And that, because the hydrologic cycle is, is even noisier than the temperature, you need more data to really confirm that that's happening. There are, there is some data that suggests that the frequency of rainfalls over a certain level has increased, uh, but um, it's, it, it's an area where there's still uh, more data is needed. Uh, uh, so I think we're at a point where the frequency of extremes is beginning to be noticeably affected, but it's just at a level where scientists are still debating to what degree uh, it's happening. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much for your presentations, and thanks everyone for coming to this press conference. Our next press conference is going to be at 2 p.m., on the Great Mississippi Flood of 2011.